Hi, guys. <laughs> so Thatcher Demko joining practice. It didn't quite go as we sort of suspected, at least in the uh, in concept, but he was there. Explain. Yeah, I saw him with my own two eyes. Uh, came out, worked <laughs> with Ian Clark and Yogi Svetkovsky, the, the skills coach. Uh, went through about 15 minutes of drills, and uh, I, I, say, I saw for about 15 minutes. He may have been out there uh, a little bit longer before we were allowed access into the building, but uh, out there in the back in black jerseys that they will wear against the Arizona Coyotes. And, uh, yeah, you're looking at a little video of Thatcher Demko being put through his paces. So uh, first time that I've seen him on the ice since he went down on March the 9th, one month ago to the day. And I know he was out on the road trip and skated after practice there, but wasn't on that trip. So uh, my first look at him, and you know, again, I, I'm not going to make any rash judgments, but the very fact that he's out there and going through the workouts that look like pretty standard goaltender drills, well, these are all promising signs. He's not going to play on Wednesday against Arizona, but uh, perhaps Saturday. Uh, although, you know, a little surprised that uh, if they have an eye on Saturday that he isn't staying out for an entire practice here. I would think that uh, he would probably want a couple of practices to face NHL shooters to try yeah. to get his timing back and just get back into that rhythm and routine. Whatever the case, we've seen Thatcher Demko. He lives, he exists, and uh, he looks like he is on the comeback trail here in the next week or so. And that'd be a hell of a spot to drop in, into. I mean, I know, maybe... Yeah. Against Edmonton, maybe, you know, things are such where you don't have to worry about the Oilers anymore by Saturday. <laughs> Jeff, that would be a hell of a spot to drop him into. It, it would, Matt, but, but a week later, he's playing playoff hockey, if all goes well, right? Yeah. And so you're not facing the Oilers in the first round, but you're going to face good opponents, and it could very well be the team that they saw last night in the Vegas Golden Knights. So I hear you, and you're right. If you're drawing up a, a return-to-play plan, it's probably not facing McDavid and Drysettle, but maybe he doesn't face McDavid. Uh, That's right. What's yes. going on there? Uh, whatever the case, he's a competitor. He wants to get back in there. That much we're sure of. So, you know, if it is in Edmonton, now the clock's ticking with just two games remaining. So uh, let's see if Rick Tockett is willing to divulge any more of a timeline on, you know, this organization's plans for its number one goaltender. And we don't have a practice timeline for Thursday, Friday yet either, right? We I, Is it sound like a practice Thursday and a departure day on Friday? Would that be your guess at this point? My hunch would be Thursday would be a game day, a day off for this hockey club. So. Yeah. Uh, they had Sunday off and then Monday, Wednesday games, a Tuesday practice for most of them here. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, there's lacrosse in the building on Friday. So if they skate in town, it's going to be uh, out at UBC or maybe that is just a travel day and get a full game day skate in on Saturday. But if De if the plan is to get Demko back into game action on Saturday, I do think that the practice plan here this week is important and is a big piece of this puzzle. So, uh, you know, we'll try to uh, dig around a little bit and see if we can come up with what their plans are. But as I sit here right now, I I'm not quite certain how the rest of the week unfolds. And any concern hey. for the big guns that aren't at practice today? I think this is a day off uh, for a job yeah. well done uh, yeah. for all the milestones that were reached. And and clearly, guys, and we've talked about this, uh, Brock Besser has played the games. He hasn't missed any games here, but uh, hasn't been available after he scored against Anaheim on that Sunday, Easter Sunday afternoon, wasn't available. Uh, had the maintenance practice day there uh, the following day. You know, he, he scored last night, obviously, but wasn't around to get in treatment after. So, I mean, clearly, and Rick Tockett even said that he – you know, was playing through something last night, and there was some question about whether he was going to be available. A uh, good thing for him and the Canucks that he was such a big goal, uh, not just the milestone, but the timing of that goal to make it 3 3 to, you know, cue the comeback ultimately to get them ahead for the first time in that hockey game uh, moments later from Connor Garland. So, Besser's clearly playing through something. I think we've suspected that maybe Petey's been dogged by. Uh, some sort of nagging injury as well. And I think for JT Miller, it's just uh, a lot of miles on that body this season when you think of the hard minutes that he has played and the way that he has performed. So if this is a, a reward for 100 points, then uh, good on him. Enjoy the day off. Uh, before we uh, leave goaltending, who starts against the Coyotes Wednesday, Jeff? Not Demko, but who? <laughs> Uh, I would think uh, winning you're in right now. I, I would think yeah. Dr. Silovs probably gets the opportunity here. Um, again, I'd feel more confident saying that if I knew that Demko was ready to go on Saturday. Uh, you know, do you want to throw Casey DeSmith in against the Oilers if he hasn't played in over a week? Uh, but Arthur Silas responded and rebounded. I mean, that first goal was brutal at any level. And I felt for the guy, uh, you know, the build up, the Stanley Cup champs in town, talking about one of the biggest games of the year. And two minutes in, puck goes right through him, like sifted right through him. 
Uh, and the second one, not much he can do there. Somebody probably should have uh, checked Jack Eichel the way that uh, he was dealing. But from that point on, he had to make some saves. And in the second period, in a tight game, once the Canucks had leveled things, uh, made a nice save sliding across from his left to his right on Noah Hannafin on the back door. Uh, Michael Amadio had a two-on-one. Uh, and he looked, uh, he stared him down there. And then the penalty kill in that third period. And look, this penalty kill is taking on way too much water. But when EP40 took the penalty with 10 minutes to go and a one goal lead, like that was crunch time and Silovs did his part there. So uh, ultimately, you know, at the end of the night, he wins the hockey game. He's three and oh this year and now six and two as a National Hockey League goaltender. Yeah. So it's hard to argue with the wins and losses there, you know, stylistically. Sure, there's lots to work on. Uh, but I, you know, right now, I mean, if it is about locking everything down that's available to you and still trying to, you know, extend that lead over the Oilers, I think I might come back with Arthur Silovs and give him another opportunity to, to win again on Wednesday night. And yeah. last time out, they struggled to get to 20 shots. So it's yeah. probably, it may not be high event anyway. You mentioned Pedersen. What did you make of Elias last night, Jeff? Yeah. I mean, he's going a world-class screener, if nothing else. And, uh, you know, I know people want the end-to-end -end goals and the highlight reels. Uh, I thought... Like it's a tiny little thing, but I thought it actually was a fairly sizable statement. The first power play they got, they won the draw, they got it in his wheelhouse, and he absolutely unloaded the one timer. And there's all this talk in the market about, oh, he's reluctant to shoot the puck, and you know, is there something wrong? I thought that was a really good sign for him and for the hockey club, and it just kind of, you know, it, it set the tone for this relentless power play that would not be denied, and ultimately. It was Connor Garland scooping in the, the loose change at the side of the net, but Elias Pedersen played a role in that power play. Uh, but really, like you think about the, the price you have to pay against this big Vegas defense, and you know that was one of the things the Canucks did really, really well last night was get to the inside. How many times have we heard Tockett imploring his guys to, to get there? One thing to get there, another to stay there. And for him to take the goaltender's eyes away on Brock's goal, uh, but just to be a net front presence, you know, and that's not necessarily something we think of when you, you think of Elias Pedersen and all of his traits, but... Did a really nice job of it against a, a big Vegas defense. So, no, I, I, I thought, you know, again, was he the first star? No, he wasn't. There were a lot of guys that had bigger offensive nights than he did on both sides uh, of the ice. But, you know, he was pulling the rope in the right direction, and he's chipping away and, you know, kind of quietly picking up points here as he goes. So, yeah, I mean, I thought the Los Angeles game, there were some signs. I think this was building on that, but we're all still still waiting for that signature moment that we haven't seen really since the Buffalo win a, a month ago. It did seem like there was something said by the coach, by the way, of take the puck to the net. I mean, I, I think almost every forward had the puck at one point and went hard to the net with the puck. Yeah. And you know, if you're thinking prior to the game against a team like Vegas, like the game plan, you want to get to the inside, but easier said than done. I mean, think last year, go back a year when Rick Tockett, how many times did he refer to what Vegas had assembled as this massive defense core? And you, you could just see Tockett drooling and dreaming of the day that he'd have something like that. And they've been able to replicate it to a degree here in Vancouver. So not easy to get to the net and to take the puck there and have success, but they did a really nice job of it. And, you know, I, I like you can't pick your opponent come playoff time. They're going to face a good team. We know that, but I think last night, I tweeted this out. Like, if it ends up being Vegas, they split the season series. They scored four goals last night. They scored three in two of the other games. They lost and were schooled in the first game of the season series back in November. But they won two of three here recently. You know, the power play was going. Uh, your best players came through. Like, if they're looking for motivational cues, if, in fact, they do draw Vegas in the first round... Like compare that to the way things went against the Los Angeles Kings all season long. I do think that there are some things that the Canucks could at least build on. I'm not sitting here making any brash predictions that uh, they're going to dethrone the champs, but I, you know, just when I'm looking at the two matchups and the way the teams have played, the Canucks actually had a fair degree of success, if you can call going two and two. Uh, but the way the season series started, it ended up with two wins apiece mm -hmm. and looked pretty good last night. Um, forgive me, uh, have we accounted for Elias Lindholm? At practice, and I what's next not, for him? I, I'm not in a position to see the ice right now, so uh, I can't. I didn't. See he wasn't him. there early then. Jeff. He wasn't there early, so yeah. I, uh, yeah. Hmm. I'm running short there mm -hmm. uh, as well. Um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what comes of that. Uh, of anything. Uh, lastly, Jeff, all the milestones last night. Which one was your favorite? I think it has to be Brock getting to 100. Or <laughs> he wishes. Uh, Brock getting to 40 goals. There were too many milestones. Um, look, I've covered him since day one here. Uh, we know the storylines. Uh, they abound, obviously. 
And we wondered at the outset of the season, I mean, I asked him at training camp a year ago or two years ago, almost now about, uh, was this the year for 30? And obviously it wasn't last year. And so for him to get to 30, to do that on home ice, to get to 40 and do that in front of the home fans and for it to be a, a big goal. Like I was thinking about this earlier. Like he had always been a goal scorer. We know that 29 in his first season, he backed it up with 26 more the, the following year. He scored a bunch of goals early in his career, but he did so on horrible teams through no fault of his own. And so I just have to imagine that it's so much more rewarding for him to score big goals in big games against good opponents. He scored the winner against the Boston Bruins in here in overtime uh, uh, six weeks ago, and then against the Stanley Cup champs to level that game at three. And so to be contributing to the cause that is something so much bigger than just him padding statistics. And I know those early career goals, I mean, you know, I'm sure they all felt good, but they're sort of empty calories. These ones just have so much more weight behind them now. And so uh, just a really cool moment to see Brock Besser become a 40-goal scorer in the National Hockey League. And that is not to demean JT no. getting to 100 because uh, that's an incredible accomplishment for him. And, you know, I, I like Connor Garland and just his openness and honestness after, you know, 400. To some guys, it's just a number. And I know he tried to downplay it, but for a little guy that was told a billion times he was <laughs> too small and would never get there, for him to play 400 and score his 100th goal uh, in that same game, it really was just a cool sort of happening there on a day of the eclipse, all these cosmic happenings uh, to bring all these guys together to their, their big round numbers. Cosmic yeah. happening. Well, yes. I, I know, but I mean, think back 2017, 2018, like our only fascination was, oh, this Besser kid. And yep. he's a goal scorer and yep. he's a pretty smart hockey player and he's actually better two way and he's got to improve his speed, but there's a lot to like there. Then he's joined by this fleet of terrific young talent, of course. And uh, I don't want to say gets lost, but he wasn't the focal point. He wasn't the fixation for us anymore. It's awesome to see him get to that number 40 and have the career season that he's having. It's uh, why I picked the backdrop here behind me as well for the, yeah, well the viewers done, here. Well I, I, done. I look like I've got his stick in my ear as a Q-tip, but uh, <laughs> it is one of the photos that adorns the wall here in the press box. Hey, at, at they Rogers do wax Arena. their blades now, so that would be uh, <laughs> not a bad idea. Jeff will let you get downstairs, cover practice, and bring us everything uh, that is said after the fact. Thank you for this, and we'll catch up on Friday. All right, guys. Sounds good. Thanks. Jeff Patterson, Jay Patter, Canucks reporter, of course, the rink, uh, host of Rinkwide Vancouver. And if you're unaware, Rinkwide Vancouver, now on YouTube, now immediate after the game. Check it out Wednesday after the Vancouver Canucks face the Arizona Coyotes. Two bits of housekeeping. I got it. Two Go bits ahead. of housekeeping. Uh, Lindholm is out there. Um, so that's the good news uh, for Canucks fans. He remains an option. He's getting, I mean, this would have been an easy day off for him. If a lot of other guys were taking maintenance days, it would have been an easy one for him to take off. So maybe a good sign that he's out there. Uh, secondarily, mm -hmm. uh, we hadn't fully referenced the McDavid injury. He's officially day to day. Uh, Jeff was making reference to that about Demko facing McDavid. Um, yeah. Yeah. It look, looks like McDavid might be touch and go for tomorrow's game against the Vegas Golden Knights, which almost serves the Canucks just as well as him missing the game versus the Canucks because, of course, a win for the Golden Knights uh, helps the Canucks immensely. So uh, even if he misses versus Vegas but plays versus Vancouver, um, that still could be helpful for the Canucks. He's officially listed data. He's not ruled out yet versus Vegas, but it's questionable at this point. Do you sense any sandbagging there? In what sense? Well, just that the Oilers would like others to believe that Connor's not 100%. Oh. It, 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 like, it, is that a way? There is the, a moment people are is pointing that, to. Is, 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 is that a way for the Oilers to basically get McDavid some rest down the stretch? Or looking at it and going, okay, we're not going to catch the Canucks for first. Do we really want to imperil 97 in games when we're effectively locked into second? Um, people say that there is an injury that he suffered with five minutes to play on against Calgary on Saturday. Okay. Um, so there is a they're moment. pretty much they're pretty much clear Vegas, right? They're six up on Vegas yeah. with a game in hand. So they there's no downside really anymore I, to the Oilers season. I mean, I suppose if you lose out or do something squirrely like that. I think they just call it a maintenance day, though. I think they would just say it's a maintenance day. You think so? Yeah. Like the, the fact that okay. it's now come out as injury, I don't know. I don't I don't think he needed that. Hey everybody, if you're enjoying what you're seeing here, 
then follow along with Sakaris and Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.